Joshua, the classic beginning of philosophy of biology was a, a classification system, a taxonomy of where all the different species fit and what's a species and what's the, the order and how the whole system works. Uh, but I have found the concept of classification very useful to understand new areas. As, as biology has uh, developed and there are new areas that we really don't understand, the concept of a classification, what are the, the different uh, natural kinds in the category? How can you be um, a universally exhaustive in, 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 in encompassing everything in the, in the class? Uh, are they mutually exclusive or do they overlap? I mean, these kinds of classification systems for new knowledge I have found helpful. Uh, do you, when you think of, of biology, uh, what, what are the classification ways of thinking that you've used? Yeah, you know, um, if biology is about classification, maybe it's just an extension of Adam's work in the garden, you know, just naming everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, classification is really core to biology, and it's also one of the most bedeviling aspects of it, right? Yeah. Uh, famously, how many definitions of species are there? Over 20 of them, right? Yeah. You might think it's because biologists really are, uh, just don't have their act together, but there's something else going on. It turns out that uh, these are all very operationalized definitions, and we're all working in different aspects of the question, so it's not really possible to unify them fully. Uh, so, you know, if you're a paleontologist, you can legitimately ask, you know, if an ankylosaurus is really just the same species as a Tyrannosaurus rex and come to a good conclusion that they're really not. You're going to do that based on looking at bones and other aspects of the fossil record. That's going to be a fundamentally different question than, you know, if we're dealing with animals that are living today where we can, you know, ask if they hybridize and look at their your genetic data and well, we can't. And so we're going to use different criteria in these two different places, and that's actually appropriate. And there's really not going to be a good way to reconcile those two different sorts of... Nor necessarily should there be. Yeah, there shouldn't be. Because so the world is not divided into categories. I mean, we're imposing our categories on the world, and so it's very natural that we will do that in different, for different purposes in different ways. Well, I mean, are we imposing the categories? Uh, probably in some cases, but I think, I think we know that there's a difference between a T-Rex and an ankylosaurus. Okay. We know there's a difference even between like a human and a chimpanzee on some level. I mean, the categories are important. It's how, how we think about things. Of course, there's going to be borders and boundaries to those categories that are a little fuzzy. So this fact that we can't actually unify our use of words uh, ends up being really fundamental to biology. It really, almost everything important in biology, uh, from homology to human to species, uh, to gene, are end up being polysemous or multivalent terms. That means that uh, polysemous means multiple meanings, and uh, and multivalent means that there's really just multiple words that are, I mean multiple meanings that are being used in a fairly precise way. That doesn't mean that these definitions are imprecise. They're very precise, but that same word can be referent to really multiple, essentially incompatible and distinct precise definitions. What are examples? Well, species is the one that I gave, right? Yeah. So we can be meaning precisely, you know, a particular level of genetic difference or a particular a methodology for deriving this from paleontology, but those, those ideas don't map. But, but it, it could also be in terms of homology, the term homology, right? That can mean very different things in different contexts uh, of how it's determined and what's meant by it. And it'll be very precise. And it'll be, it feels like it's ambiguous if you haven't really parsed out how it's being used in each of the different so with contexts. With homology, what's, what's an example that, that could be interpreted in different ways, each one legitimate? Yeah, so sometimes homologous is used to just mean very similar. Uh, Features of the body. Uh, yeah, uh, because that's all you really have direct access to, is to looking at the things themselves and looking at that. And other times, and probably the more proper definition, even though it's not this idea of similarity, this idea that has a shared ontology, it arises evolutionarily from the same place. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, there's ambiguity in making that assessment. So uh, at times people are meaning it with different levels of precision. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing with, with, with human. Do we mean anatomically human? Do we mean minds like ours? And how uh, like us does it have to be yeah. before it actually meets that criteria? Uh, and it also comes because there's a clash of different fields. Vector is a great example of that. Uh, and if you're a virologist or immunologist, vector means a virus. Yeah. <laughs> it, means the way, it means what's causing the disease, right? Or, um, but if you're, a, if you're a computational biologist, you might be thinking 
about a mathematical metric. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a really, yeah, that's, that's a big difference. And you know, if you're a physicist that's playing around here, you might yeah. think it means a direction. Right. Now, which of these uses of the term vector is right? Well, it'd be a mistake to say they're all right, because in some cases, one will be right, in other cases, another one will be right. There, there is a precision to the use, and a big part of working, especially in, in a field like computational biology, is learning how to navigate mm. this incredible plurality of languages that arises in biology out of multivalent yeah. use of words. And, th and this gives philosophers at least uh, some, some job security. Yeah, it, it's, it's actually fairly common for there to be big debates um, in, in the fields. Uh, for example, about the extended synthesis, where a lot of it really boils down not actually to fundamental scientific disagreements, uh, but it really comes down to a different use of words. Mm. Um, another, another one uh, is ancestry, right? So uh, when you think about ancestry from a um, genetic point of view, it just means this really weird idea of uh, you know, direct inheritance of DNA. That's genetic ancestry. Uh, but genealogical ancestry is another way to understand ancestry, which has to do with just biological parentage. Often these two ideas are really conflated as seen as the one, but they're very distinct. And depending on what type of question you're trying to ask, you're going to really want to go after mm -hmm. one or the other. Yeah. You, and you've used that very uh, effectively in, uh, in some of your work uh, in, the, in the historical atom. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that's a great example, too, where, you know, biology really can't be seen as a single discipline. It's really multiple disciplines. And it's also multiple disciplines that are in conversation with things outside of biology, mm -hmm. too, whether it be chemistry, medicine, physics, or even religion. And, and, and in philosophy at times, there's these direct sorts of exchanges. And, and it's often underappreciated how, uh, how varied the use of a particular word is across biology. It's just, it can be just really across the spectrum and species is one of those classic examples.